Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down. We're asking questions. Questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world, let's face it, don't know God for sure, and definitely is in deep need of more love, don't you think? I mean, take a look around. There's a lot of bad news out there. How can I take the good news and apply it into my daily living so that I can become a light in that darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God, making present His kingdom. Not someday, but today and every day. That's what this show is all about. So glad you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one. But before we get into it, my tooth broke. The back tooth just split in two. You know, you're getting old when your teeth just start breaking. So I have to go to the dentist. So I go to the dentist and he lives in another town, uh, Charleston, West Virginia. It's about two hours away. So I go see the dentist, and of course I get there like I get everywhere way too early. And so I go to the local bookstore. I think it's like Books a Million or something, and start looking around, killing time. Well, next to this bookstore is a craft store called Michael's, Michael's Frame Shop. And I, I wander in there, and I'm confronted with this big bin full of artificial flowers. Now, I have a long, tortured relationship with flowers. I've tried flowers on the set for many years. Uh, I, I, I'm not a fan of fake flowers because they, well, they look fake. Um, you you got to use real flowers, fresh cut flowers. That takes a lot of maintenance. It's pretty expensive. You have shadow issues. So to flower, to not to flower, this, is, this has been something that's been going on for, for years. But I looked at these flowers, and I'm like, well, they look pretty good. And I looked down and there was this rose. I picked it up, it was a white rose. And it looked real. And it was $6, you know, just for one rose. So I thought, well, maybe. And I put together a bouquet. Maybe I could put together a bouquet and use it for the show. So I'm, I'm putting something together. I'm in this, this, this uh, Michael's um, craft store in a town where I don't know anybody. And and, and I'm putting it together, I get something looking pretty good, and this woman walks by, and she's got her cart, and she's walking by slowly, and I could tell she's looking at me, so I, I look up and I, and I hold up the flowers, I say, what do you think about these flowers? And she said, well, I think they would look amazing on your TV show that I watch every Sunday. I'm like, wow. I mean, what are the chances that you would run into a daily living fan in a city where you don't know anybody picking out flowers that you're really not a fan of, it must be a sign. But I say all of that to say this, we have no idea how many people we are reaching with the good news. The Spirit works in mysterious ways, my friend, and I want to thank all of my partners for helping me do that, helping me take the good news to a lost world. It is an absolute privilege to be able to do that and to run into people that are actually watching this broadcast. But what do you say we quiet our minds, put ourselves in the presence? God's got a message for you today, my friend. God's ready to speak. The question is, are you ready to listen? We're going to school. The question is, are you ready to be the student? God speaks to us in many ways, but one very powerful way is his word. So what do you say if we get to it? A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me. I guarded them and none of them was lost except the son of destruction in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. I gave them your word and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in the truth. 
Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I consecrate myself for them so that they also may be consecrated in the truth. The gospel of the Lord. And what a gospel it is, my friend. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about this gospel. It's a deep pool. There's a whole lot to talk about. And how we can take this message that God is trying to communicate to us and apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. Thank you so much for watching the broadcast. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your homes each and every week and share the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to grab a piece of paper and a pencil because on the next break, we're going to show you how you might be able to become a partner with Daily Living and how we might be able together to take the good news to a lost world. Welcome back to Daily Living. So today we find ourselves in the Gospel of John. And as often it is the case, we are picking up in the middle of a much larger story. Jesus is praying to his Father, and it is interesting to consider what Jesus is praying for and who Jesus is praying for. Consider for a moment how we pray. Most of our prayers, I think we're asking for something. We call these prayers of petition. Or maybe we're praying out of a sense of gratitude. We call these prayers of thanksgiving. Or maybe we're remorseful, regretful, and we're asking for forgiveness. We call these prayers of contrition. Or maybe, just maybe, we're praying for His will to be done in our lives. You know, that prayer that came out of the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Lord, but Thy will be done. But today we find Jesus, and He is praying to His Father. And I think it is worth noting what He is praying for and who he is praying for. Because it turns out in the beginning, he's praying for his disciples. But then he says, I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So who's that? Well, that, that's us. So we, we very clearly see that Jesus is praying for us. And as we penetrate the deeper meanings of our gospel today, this is something that we need to keep in mind. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for me. Now remember, this is just hours before his suffering is going to come. You know, as a priest, I receive many phone calls, all kinds of different things, but they pretty much boil down to two categories. Either it's good news such as, well, we're getting married, or we, we, we want the baby to be baptized, or we're having a big celebration, and we'd really like you to be a part of it, or it's Father C, I just got the news. And you can always tell immediately, simply by the tone of the voice, which of the two it's going to be. Now, when it comes to the second call, it often is connected with some type of death. Not always. But often it is the case, it's either somebody's very ill, they're on the doorstep of, of death, or, or maybe it is somebody has just died. But, but sometimes it's, it's, it's a marriage that is imploding. Maybe somebody just lost their job, or maybe it's a wayward son or daughter lost in a sea of addiction. There, there's a thousand different scenarios of how this plays out. But what the second kind of calls seem to have in common is an anxiousness, an irritation, an uncomfortability, if that's a word, depression, filled with anxiety. And no, no peace, for sure, no peace. And, and, and like I said, there's a thousand variations of the story, um, but it always kind of comes down to a common theme of, of something or someone has done this to me. And somehow, if this had not happened, or maybe that had not happened, uh, they would be happy. But, you know, really, and I, got, and I got to be careful here. 
because I don't want to seem like I'm minimizing the suffering of people because it's real. But truth be told, most of the case, the idea that this not happening or that not happening and then I'd, I'd be happy is, is really fantasy because truth be told, the anxiousness and the irritation, while it can be exacerbated and heightened by people, places, and things, most of the time it's an internal origin, if you know what I mean, it's an inside struggle. That, that, uh, that anxiety, that fear, that depression, that despair has everything to do with a battle that's going on between ourselves and the person in the mirror, the person we wake up with in the morning, the person we go to bed with every night. Now, you know, that, that might be a revelation for some, but hear me out. My guess is that most of us don't spend a whole lot of time staring at ourselves in the mirror. Maybe in the morning when we brush our teeth or, or, or comb our hair, you know, me not so much, but most of us, we don't spend that much time eyeballing ourselves. I mean, really holding our own gaze. But once in a while, if we do, what so often happens? A big, you know, anxiousness, a discontent will stare back at you. And this has been with us since the very beginning. I mean, think about it. If you, go, if, you, if you get into the way back machine and you go way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve first took that bite from the forbidden fruit, what happened? They realized that they were naked. They were lacking. It was a problem. Wasn't a problem before, but now it's a problem. They've been naked their whole life, and it's never been an issue, but now it is. After the concept of good and evil starts coursing through their veins, all of a sudden they notice, and falsely so, that they are flawed. And this stays with us in our conversation in the mirror today. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not interesting enough. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too big. I'm too small. When people look at me, they notice my nakedness as they see my flaws. This is the source of anxiousness. This is the source of irritation and oppression. And it is almost always rooted in fear. That fear that our nakedness and flaws will be exposed. I'm going to be found out. And this is where the big sigh in the mirror comes from. Now, I know I'm getting a bit out there, okay? But stick with me. A point is coming, I promise. You know, I went to school at Notre Dame, and I, and I, studied, and I studied philosophy. Now, philosophy, it's an interesting thing. In a nutshell, philosophy is... is is human beings studying how other human beings think, right? I mean, there's many different types of philosophies. Some would be better off described as insanities, but some are often very interesting. Uh, they all seem to have a common quest of trying to answer the universal questions that plague all of us at some point in our life, such as, who am I? Why am I here? Does my life have any meaning? Where did God go? Now. One, one of the philosophies that I found very interesting, fascinating in college was, was called existentialism. Now, existentialism is defined as a philosophical theory that emphasizes the individual as a free agent determining their own self through acts of the will. In other words, you can find the meaning of life within yourself. Or, in other, other words, you can become your own God. You alone decide what is right. You alone decide what is wrong. You decide what is good, what is evil. You become the uberman, the superhuman, the existentialist. But you see, here's the problem. When you make yourself the highest authority in your own life, it's rather limiting. It's kind of like being locked up in a room full of mirrors. Might be interesting for a while, 
but you know, in time it gets a bit tedious because you see, we were created by God and like anything that's created, we were created for a purpose. And the problem with making yourself your own God is that the purpose becomes what you decide it's going to be. So in the end, you end up worshiping the creature rather than the creator and you have no purpose or at least it is misplaced. But let's get back to those questions of who am I? Why am I here? Does my life have any meaning? Where did God go? As I noted before, I've come to believe that the root, the origin of most people's anxiety comes from within. Anxiety is heightened when we seek meaning in all the wrong places, such as perceptions of how people view me, the position I have, the title I have, the house I live in, the car I drive, okay, all of that defining who I am. And when that stops working, I get anxious. And that's when I get the call. Now, I say all of that to say this. In our gospel today, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. So if you find yourself staring in the mirror, wondering who you are, consider this. Jesus is praying for you. Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, if it's important to you, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with what we're trying to do here. If you would commit to a monthly gift of any amount, I'll send you a monthly newsletter, small gift of appreciation, and if you give me your email address, I will provide you with a weekly transcript of the show prior to its broadcast. You can send a check to Daily Living, 181 St. Brandon Way, Elkins, West Virginia, 26241, or go online at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can take the good news to a lost world. Welcome back to Daily Living. When I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me, and I guarded them. Now keep in mind, this is Jesus praying to the Father. And what is he saying in regards to us? That we have been given to him by the Father. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are gift to Jesus from the Father. Now, I want you to let that sink in. The God who created the whole universe and everything in it, yeah, that God, he chose to give his son the most precious gift he could ever give. And that gift is you. Now you take that to the mirror when you start considering I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm too big. I'm too small. You are gift, my friend. A gift so precious that only the Father's Son would ever be worthy to receive you. But now I am coming to you. I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. Now, now keep in mind, he's talking to his disciples right now, and they're not having a good day. This is, this is not a good day. They're full of fear. They're full of anxiety. All they had hoped for, their dreams, hopes, and desires, every, it's all gone. Well, it's, it's going very quickly. Everything that they have left, their families and their jobs and, and lands, it's all gone away. The Pharisees are threatening to put them in jail. Jesus is starting to talk about dying. He's told them that he's got to go away. They can't follow. They don't get it. They don't have a clue. Think of all the conversations they were having in front of the mirror these days. Think about the fear, the disappointment, the anger. It, it wasn't supposed to happen this way. And now Jesus says, Father, I am telling you this so that their joy may be complete. Oh, really? <laughs> Come again? Joy? How can there be joy in this situation? What kind of joy is he even talking about? Well, the joy will come as they, and by extension us, finally discover the answer to the mere question of who am I? 
they will find their joy in time as they find their identity in their relationship with Jesus. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. When Jesus first said this, it didn't really make a lot of sense, okay? But it's about ready to. I gave them your word, and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. That line, it's curious, but it's a real clue as to the joy that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is referring to you, remember, and you are gift, given by the Father who created you to his Son. And who you are is a possession of Jesus. And it's a possession that he is willing to die for. You are not of this world. Jesus goes on. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Wow, think about that for a moment. Okay, let's just let that sink in, okay? When Jesus first spoke these words, he was hours away from unimaginable suffering as he suffered the consequences of everything evil that was ever created since the world began. Everything outside of the will of God. And through all that suffering, he did not gain the world. No, you know what he gained? You. He would rather have you than the world. I mean, think about that. I'll take that to the mirror when you have your saw. He would rather have you than the whole world. Scriptures prove that. Remember that third temptation in the desert? The devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms and the principalities of the world and said, all of this can be yours if you worship me. What did the devil offer Jesus? The world and everything in it. But Jesus didn't want it. Jesus did not want the devil's gift. He did not receive it. But he did receive the Father's gift, and the Father's gift is you. You know, as a priest, I officiate weddings. I love weddings. And there's this one moment in the wedding when the father gives away his daughter to the groom. And it's a very special moment. Often it's very emotional in the eyes of the father because it's a sense of fear, hope, and joy all at the same time. He's turning over his most precious gift, a gift that has greater value than everything else that he has combined. Scriptures call those who belong to Jesus the bride of Christ. So back to who am I? That mirror question that we ask ourselves. Let us realize who we in fact belong to and not rely on the perceptions of other people. Let us not rely on people, places, or things. Let us not rely on titles or possessions. Let us not be defined by what we have, but let us be defined by us belonging to Christ, who loves us so much that he laid down his life for us. And as good as that sounds, it gets even better. Jesus says, Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is the truth. You sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. I consecrate myself for them so that they may be also consecrated in truth. So that word, consecrate, what does that word mean, consecrate? Well, what does consecrate mean? What does a consecrated life mean? Well, consecrate means to make holy or to dedicate oneself to a higher purpose. It's coming from the Latin word sanctus, which is where we get the words holiness, sanctify, sanctification, sacred. So what Jesus is really saying here, as Jesus is praying to the Father, is make us sacred in truth. So, what to do? How can we take this and apply it into our daily living? Well, first of all, let us remember that when life comes on life's terms, when the shadow falls upon us, which it always does, when the anxiousness and the despair comes calling, remember who you are, my friend. You are gift. 
Out of everything that God could have ever given his son in the universe, he chose to give his son you. A gift so precious that, you'll, that Jesus is willing to die. I speak this into the world so that they may share my joy completely. In Acts, we read how the Sanhedrin brought the disciples and had them flogged because they wouldn't stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And as they left, they were rejoicing and filled with joy because they had been found worthy to suffer humiliation and disgrace for the name. They knew who they were because they knew to whom they belonged. And it was not of this world. They had joy. Now, that seems a bit odd, finding joy in suffering. But, you know, they had joy. Why? Because they had purpose. And it's an eternal purpose. They had a mission, something that was bigger than themselves. And that mission is love. And let us carry that love into this world. Yes, my friend, you too are on a mission. So the next time the shadows begin to fall in your life, when the rains come and buffet the house, and you're looking in the mirror thinking, I'm not good enough, remember who you are. Remember to whom you belong. And remember that you have been purchased at a price. Remember the mission. And that mission is to shine the light of love in this fallen world in which we are not a part of. We have been called out. We are his special possession. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that we who believe in him may never die but have life eternal. That's the mission that we are called to carry. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>